Now, another side to the Iraq war effort keyed to the congressional debate over the Defense Department's budget. Here's the first of a three-part series on how the military decides which equipment to provide U.S. troops. Tonight, the subject is body armor. The very latest body armor. I'm confident as a product manager that we are fielding the best body armor that is available to our soldiers. But then, how to explain this? If my son gets shot in the chest while he's wearing one of these things, he was murdered. How you doing? Thank you very much. God bless. Families across the country, like Javier and Marion La Rosa, have for several years now been trying to buy different body armor for loved ones headed to Iraq. The least that we can do is giving something to give you a better chance of going back alive. It's bad enough that they're there and being shot at, but to not have the best possible equipment is criminal. The charge in its starkest form, that the way our military buys equipment, the procurement system, has wound up shortchanging our troops in combat, costing lives at the front, both American and Iraqi. The debate has raged very visibly over the body armor issued to U.S. troops. Interceptor, made by six different contractors, outer vest made of Kevlar and material to repel flak and even pistol rounds, inserted ceramic plates to resist assault rifle fire. Thank you very much and, uh, and God bless you. Families like the La Rosas in Tennessee have been raising money to privately buy armor called Dragon Skin. Its scale-like design of overlapping ceramic discs, its manufacturer claims, repels bullets better, is more flexible, covers more of the body. But the Army and Marines have banned Dragon Skin because, says Mark Brown, the general now in charge of procuring body armor, it failed the Army's test. The bottom line is it does not meet Army standards. Some parents, however, are suspicious of the testing and say the troops are getting a raw deal. Then don't tell me that I can't protect my son or my son-in-law or my partner, etc., with the best possible vest because of Army politics. I won't tolerate it. At a book event in Washington recently, Pierre Spray, an engineer who helped design the F-16 fighter, worked under Robert McNamara at the Pentagon and has since become a critic of it, said the reason is obvious there's a revolving door between the military and industry. Thus, those in the procurement system, when they spend money... Spend it on the high-ticket items that would get them their jobs as vice presidents of Northrop and Grumman and McDonald and Boeing and so on. Because all the contractors were behind it, the congressmen were voting like crazy for it, and all the generals, you know, were seeing their future, their future retirement depended on these programs. Programs like the $110 million Osprey, the 350 million F-22, this 2.5 billion submarine, a new 3.3 billion dollar destroyer, the 13.7 billion dollar CVN-21 aircraft carrier. Meanwhile, one complete set of interceptor body armor goes for less than a thousand dollars. To outfit our entire armed forces, active and reserve, two billion dollars at most, says former Marine Colonel Jim McGee, who went into the body armor industry, claims that because of the modest amounts... Uh, there's no constituency for body armor in America. And is Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon in the body armor business? Hell no. You know, there's no money in it. I'm or not enough money to avoid worrying about cost. In order to reduce cost in something that's made of fabrics, you need to reduce the amount of fabric that's in the item. And in the case of body armor, that's Kevlar which is where they went to the, you know, shrank at the shoulders to this almost bra strap-like thing they have now. Big scallop in the back of the body armor that makes no sense at all. I mean, it exposes your kidneys, but it took out 200 inches. And 200 inches translates to cost. Jim. Working within the cost constraints, McGee helped develop the Army's interceptor body armor but has become a fan of its band rival, Dragon Skin, a technology he says... is two generations ahead of anything I've ever seen. And he's not the only one. Newcomer Dragon Skin has been hyped on cable TV. How do you feel about that, huh, buddy? This guy doesn't have any bullet holes in him. No, sir. Rah-rah clips are up on the internet. Everywhere, boom, 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 rounds, everywhere. A firefight in Iraq. And in May, American NBC Indian. News investigative reporter Lisa Myers did several stories questioning the Army's tests.
and NBC ran its own independent testing. In that testing, Dragon Skin outperformed the Army's body armor in stopping the most lethal threats. The late four-star Army General Wayne Downing, an NBC News analyst, observed the tests. Well, what we saw today, Lisa, and again, it's a limited number sure. of, of, of trials, Dragon Skin was significantly better. The debate was on with a vengeance. Were our troops being shortchanged or weren't they? The Army promptly questioned NBC's test, released the data to prove Dragon Skin had failed Army testing catastrophically. We tested eight vests, four failed, 13 penetrating shots out of 48. All six of the, body, the current body armor producers of the U.S. Army in their employ passed this live fire test protocol with zero failures. Zero failures is the correct answer. One failure is sudden death and you lose the game. Congress then weighed in with a hearing. Individuals CEO Murray Neal of Pinnacle Armor, Dragon Skin's maker, blasted the Army. The information coming out from the Army is fraught full of, of inaccuracies. House members then blasted Pinnacle's CEO. Is it your intent to impugn the integrity of the Army? It astounds me to hear you suggest that our military would uh, rig the system in favor of uh, some uh, favored uh, vendor, contractor, uh, when lives are at stake. The military then, then took, took center, center stage and offered an evidence specialist Greg Miller, shot in Iraq last December. Fortunately, he was wearing interceptor body armor. With your indulgence, I'd like to thank him publicly for his outstanding service to our nation. Republican Trent Franks of Arizona, however, asked the Army to test interceptor against Dragon Skin one-on-one, -on -one, much as NBC had. But let's test this out and get to the bottom of it and uh, do what's right for the soldiers this, of, of this country. Meanwhile, the debate on blogs, military message boards, and elsewhere railed on about the adequacy of U.S. body armor and the military's testing of it. Engineer Nevin Rupert, for example, was the reigning army expert on dragon skin for one of the military's main test labs. Yet he'd been barred from the army test at which dragon skin was penetrated catastrophically. Why barred? No explanation. He was my supervisor. He determines whether I could go or not. And this is who? Um, I can't give names. Oh, okay. Being careful, his lawyer there as we spoke, Rupert won't give names. No wonder, since after objecting to his exclusion, Rupert was fired for insubordination and is now suing. Why fired? Well, he supported, and still prefers dragon skin, thinks Army officials were trying to sabotage it to protect interceptor contractors. And who was championing interceptor? A then colonel named John Norwood. He wrote a request to my directorate chief uh, requesting that I be removed from the flexible body armor program. Meanwhile, Norwood, present at the test that failed Dragon Skin, retired last summer, immediately went to work for interceptor contractor Armor Holdings with $350 million in body armor contracts in the year since Norwood's appointment. Norwood declined our request for an interview. While General Mark Brown wouldn't give us an interview either, he did talk to NBC's Lisa Myers in the spring. Are you aware that an Army colonel who oversaw the testing of Dragon Skin now works for one of the companies making the Army's current body armor? Yes, I'm aware. And you're not troubled? Uh, no, I'm not troubled at all. And you don't see a conflict of interest at all? Not since he followed all the laws and regulations and ethical rules about post-service employment. No, I don't see a conflict. But there's evidence of other interests as well. The main interceptor contractor over the years has been point blank. Yet, in 2005, the Marine Times reported that point blank's interceptor vests had been failing quality tests for two years and were now experiencing actual penetrations by bullets they were designed to repel. Marine Colonel Gabe Patricio had issued waivers to send thousands of point-blank vests from the same test lots to the front, despite complaints from the civilian tester that they would jeopardize lives. You waived point-blank vests. I waived those particular lots, that's correct. Why? Because they'd passed his own test at a private lab, says Patricio. 
and vests were badly needed at the front. In my conscience, I could not be sitting on two, three, four thousand vests that were sitting in a dispute that I was absolutely convinced after seeing independent testing that they should leave, go to the field, and provide Marines the protection that I believed they deserved. That's but fueling doubt about the procurement process is the long list of this same company's trials and tribulations. Point Blank had already been sued by several police departments accusing them of making defective vests. The Point Blank vests Patricio waived were recalled from Iraq, 5,000 of them. Point Blank's parent company, DHB, was at the time the subject of a Defense Department and a criminal investigation still ongoing. DHB's former president, who signed the waivers with Colonel Patricio, is under criminal indictment for accounting fraud. Meanwhile, three people who worked for Colonel Patricio in the Marines went to work for Point Blank's parent, DHB. Patricio himself retired two years ago and set up a company to consult with the military on the testing of, among other things, body armor. The SEC's filed an investigation on him. The uh, stockholders have a, uh, they filed suit against him. Uh, the Marines had some quality control issue with some of the vests, but somehow Point Blank kept getting the orders. I mean, it's, it's bewildering to me how this is, uh, how this can be justified. In fact, Point Blank continues to make interceptor body armor vests for our troops, getting a contract just this June for another $50 million. Meanwhile, rival Dragonskin is still banned by the Army and Marines and is under threat of debarment by the Air Force. And tonight we have details of an independent test done on the same make, model, and lot number of a vest that failed a Phoenix police officer back in November. CBS 5's Donna Rossi has been following the story. And Donna, the results caught some people off guard. Yeah, you know, I don't think they expected things to turn out exactly the way they did. It's one thing that back in November, a bullet went through the very bottom edge of an officer's vest. That's an area that manufacturers and national standards warn may be vulnerable. But it's something completely different when in a controlled setting, a bullet blasts right through the center of a vest that is designed and marketed to save lives. When it was announced that a vest, just like his, failed miserably in an independent safety test. There was one complete penetration of the vest and that projectile was not recovered. The test was done out of state yesterday. Police, union and city leaders wasted no time but taking action. I want to know how far I can push it. How is Dragonskin going to cope with a live grenade? What we got here is Bob. We've already put him through the ringer. As you can see, all the rounds we shot in the back. What we're going to do is take Bob and challenge him in a whole different way. This deadly grenade can do some serious damage. Surely the body armor doesn't stand a chance. Now it's important to remember we already shot two 9 mils, two 5.56 five, with the steel core, and two 7.62 with the steel core into this as well. So we're really pushing dragon skin to the limits. That was a deadly blast. But then, this grenade is designed to rip and punch its way through whatever's in its way. That blast was taken right up front. When you look at this, it looks like it's devastating. But when you flip it around, it looks like nothing's happened. That's what goes against the body right there. No holes in it, no big no, bulges. Exactly. Didn't, didn't even tear the nylon, which is substantial. I Bomb Squad Sergeant Alan Knight delivers his verdict. I've, I've never seen anything like that before. When we came down range, I thought we really had done some damage. And when you flip that over, I, I'm, I can't believe what I'm seeing right now. That is just part of what the Guard describes as a $1 billion across-the-board equipment shortage ranging from Humvees to machine guns. Our equipment issues do put a strain on our ability to train um, for uh, state emergencies and for overseas deployment. Baldwin is echoing Governor Schwarzenegger's complaints made to the Pentagon this week about a failure to properly equip the National Guard. 2,500 of the state's Guard members are overseas. Another 1,400 are on duty at the Mexico border. The bigger problem, the Guard says, is Washington's tardiness in buying necessary gear. The shortage is refueling debate at the Capitol over the war's effects at home.